Do I seem like a trustworthy guy? You probably barely know me, but just for my YouTube videos, do you trust me? Look at me rifling through all of that plywood. I don't know. Feels a little shady to me. I don't even know if I would trust me. But the reason I ask is because when it comes to working with plywood, a lot of the work goes into hiding the fact that it's plywood. Things like using edge banding to hide the edges, or opting for miter joints to get clean, seamless joints, all in an attempt to make plywood not look like plywood. And the reason I bring all of this up is because on this piece, I didn't do any of that. So now I'm not only using plywood to try and trick everyone into thinking that it isn't plywood, but I'm also not even doing the things to best trick everyone. And the worst part of it is that it's for my wife, the person that trusts me the most. So if I don't pull this off, I'm going to disappoint her and I'm going to feel bad and she's going to feel bad and nobody wants any of that to happen. So why make something out of plywood when I want it to look like hardwood and I have to figure out all of these ways to hide the fact that it's plywood? Well, there are plenty of reasons based on specific situations, but honestly for me in this particular case, it's really just for one reason and... Now that I think about it, I don't even know if it's a very good reason, but it's really because it just significantly decreases the amount of time that I have to put into prepping material. To make the panels for the box I'm building out of solid wood would probably take at least a day or two of just milling and gluing up panels and then a ton of sanding just to get to the point where I am right off the bat when buying plywood off the shelf. And sometimes plywood can be cheaper, which I imagine is why most people assume that using plywood is the best option. But honestly, it's often not that much cheaper, especially when you're only making one of something. And then, like I said a minute ago, I spend a bunch of time hiding the fact that it's plywood, like doing this edge banding on the front edge of the main cabinet. Now, I know I said I didn't do the usual stuff to hide the plywood a couple minutes ago, but of course, there are places where it just has to be done, and this was one of them. And on top of that, I wanted a big round over on the front edge, so this thick edge banding will allow me to do that. All that being said, if saving time was my original reason for using plywood, doing stuff like this certainly makes that reason seem not very good. So I guess help me out. Why the hell am I using plywood? Or why would you use plywood? All right, so all this talk about plywood and why I'm using it, but what am I actually making? In my never-ending quest to be fancier than I am, I've been calling this an armoire, but an armoire is usually used for holding clothes, and this piece of furniture is gonna be used to hold food. So I suppose it's really just a pantry, but pantries can be fancy too, and since it's really just a big box with shelves, you know I had to make it interesting. But before we start overcomplicating things, I had to get the box done. You've seen the main cabinet come together at this point, and I also needed a couple shelves. These two shelves will be permanently glued into the dados I cut into the side panels of the cabinet, and will help give the entire box some structure. You also may have noticed that when I made the main box, I didn't cut any bevels for miter joints, which is usually how I would build a cabinet like this out of plywood. And unfortunately, this is where the lies start. While all of the front edges of the box and shelves got edge banding, I'm leaving exposed plywood edges here and here and opting for butt joints. Doing it this way is much easier to construct, but obviously leaves edges exposed, which might seem like a bad idea. But remember, I'm a shifty, sneaky guy, so I have a plan. All right. How do you make a big plywood box look interesting? Well, I think there are a lot of ways to do that, but a good start is to make some cool looking legs. And forget the plywood for a minute, let's make something out of some solid wood. And of course, if I'm making some big legs for a big cabinet, I'm gonna need some big templates. And to make big templates, you need a big machine. Okay, you don't need a big machine, but if you have one, why not use it? So with said big templates cut out on said big machine, I could start the process of tracing out and rough cutting all of the leg parts. Two identical leg assemblies, each with four parts, 
two of which kind of had a Batman vibe to them, which is pretty cool. I'm Batman. And this process is one that you've definitely seen if you've ever watched one of my videos because it's a process that I use all the time. And it's a process that I really think opens up so many design possibilities, which is why I love talking about it and showing people how to utilize it. And if you've watched my videos, you also know that we've created a bunch of online project courses that guide any aspiring woodworker or furniture maker through the entire build process of a piece of furniture from start to finish. And many of them include this exact process. We also just released a full length course that we're giving away for free. So if you've been hesitant to invest your hard earned cash and give one of our courses a try, you can now see what they're all about for absolutely nothing. And we're really excited to get a bunch of people to check out our courses and see what they're all about. So I'll put a link to the free course and all of our other courses in the description if you're interested. I'll be the first to admit that having a shop with a five by 10 foot CNC router and two table saws, but no miter saw is a little weird. And honestly, I've never even owned a miter saw, but not because I don't think they're useful. I've just never really felt the need for one and have never wanted to take up the shop space to have one. Which is an interesting thing to say, especially as I'm making the miter cuts on the ends of these long parts using a ridiculous table saw sled setup to get it done. And I've even made two videos in the past, one on this channel and one on the Four Eyes channel with Chris about why I've never felt the need to own a miter saw and why it's a tool I think can be replaced by other tools fairly easily. And believe me, we caught some flack in the comments for it. People are pretty passionate about their miter saws and I realize that. So I just want to clear it up here once and for all and say that I think miter saws are trash and no one should own one. All right, I'm just kidding. I think they're great tools for people that need or want to use them. I just personally rarely need one, so I don't own one. But I'll admit, every once in a while, I wish I had a good one. For instance, when I was cutting the joints on those too long to be cut using a table saw sled parts. But you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. If you have a tool, use it. But if you don't have a tool, you can always figure it out. And I have to say, I always get a great result off my table saw, which means my joint faces are crisp and clean, the glue up goes way more smoothly, and that ensures I get really good glue seams. And on a piece like this, where the legs are such a focal point and the glue joints are literally in your face, stuff like that matters. One of the things that's really hard to get across in these videos is just how long some stuff takes to do. Besides showing the same repetitive task over and over again, I can't really think of a good way to show the passage of time accurately. Hey man, how can I show the passage of time accurately? Two hours later. I got nothing. So just to help illustrate the amount of time some of this stuff takes, Here's a breakdown of what I had to do just to take the two leg assemblies from glued up but still rough state to fully shaped. I have one template for each shape, so both need to be taped in place to allow me to use a template bit in my router and trim the inner curves. Each curve took maybe three passes, so probably around five minutes per curve, and to do both leg assemblies was two templates, each attached four times, then the three passes per setup, so a total of 20 minutes. From there, I could flip the piece over, change to a flush trim bit, and luckily do this in one final pass on both legs, so maybe another five minutes. One thing I do is leave the joint transitions rough and sand those smooth to prevent any ugly chip out I might get from the router bit. So some sanding with the orbital, then finish it off by hand, and do that at each joint for a total of eight times. Probably around two minutes each with the orbital, and another four or five sanding by hand, so maybe seven minutes total. After that, I wanted to add a large round over on the inside curves as well, and I'm using a gigantic round over bit. A bit this large needs to be used with care, so I had to take very light passes as I worked my way up to almost full depth. I probably raised the router bit maybe a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch for each pass, and the router bit has an inch and a half radius, so it was probably somewhere around eight to 10 passes per leg, 16 to 20 total, maybe around 
three minutes per pass. So at least an hour of doing this. And I actually think it was more than that, especially when you add in all the in-between stuff, moving parts around, taping and retaping templates, not to mention setting up cameras and getting everything I need for the video. Honestly, I don't really think this is something that anyone would be surprised by. Of course, this stuff takes a lot of time and we have to do all sorts of different things to get the video. But I guess the main thing I'm trying to get across is that I wish I could build things as fast as I can make them look in a video. That's really all I'm trying to say, I guess. What's the easiest way to simultaneously make something better and worse? I don't know if this answer works for everything, but when it comes to making furniture, I would say overcomplicating things does this pretty well. At the simplest, I need to make two doors and one drawer for this pantry, and that's pretty easy, but it's just too simple. Again, I'm just building a big box, and sometimes when I'm feeling especially pretentious, I look at the big blank area of a cabinet that the doors and drawers are gonna cover as sort of a blank canvas. Probably very, very similar to how Michelangelo felt when standing under the blank ceilings of the Sistine Chapel. So in order to satisfy my urge to be an artist and make things needlessly intricate, I came up with an integrated pole design that was needlessly intricate. And just so you can get an idea of the road ahead before getting too deep into it, the basic idea was to make the doors and drawer out of a piece of three quarter inch thick plywood laminated to a piece of quarter inch thick plywood which would allow for this large triangular cutout. Then to just give it a bit extra, I wanted to run a strip of brass down the center, which would continue through the drawer front as well. Needlessly intricate, but seems easy enough, right? Now you may notice in this footage, I'm only edge banding a few edges, in particular, only the edges that are gonna be seen when the doors or drawer are opened. And honestly, this was not the plan at the beginning. I always intended to edge band everything, but as I started to get further along, it started to make more sense to me to leave them as is. And to be honest, again, I'm not sure I would do it like this if this piece wasn't for my own home. You'll never see the plywood edges that are going to be scattered throughout this piece, and nobody will ever know. But it's just kind of one of those things, and just don't tell my wife, okay? So one of the things that happens when things get complicated during a build is that not only is the actual build process difficult and confusing, but while I'm doing it and filming everything, all I can think about is how I'm gonna explain this stuff in a video. We skate this line between explaining what we're doing for everyone that's interested in some of the minutia of the actual build and also keeping it interesting and fun to watch for the casual viewer. And stuff like all the details in the door fronts is one of those places where my ability to explain things clearly and in depth clashes with my desire to keep things light and fun. So I'll tell you this much. I bounced around a handful of different ideas on how to make these doors before finally doing them the way that I did. But does everyone want to know that I spent hours debating when and what parts to edge band? It's questionable. Then knowing I needed to cut the rabbit for the brass before laminating the panels together, but should I glue in the brass before that as well? Is that interesting for most people? I don't know. But if you're wondering, I ended up going with yes on that one, but it was debatable. Then there were the different finishes I was using. Black poly to cover the exposed plywood on the curved handles. Then a tinted finish for the inset sections. And when's the best time to apply all of those? Does anyone care? I don't know. Maybe I'm too jaded. And because I spent all of my time thinking about this stuff, I can't really understand how anyone would find it interesting, or maybe I'm just being too hard on myself. I have no idea. Also, I feel like I maybe kind of just inadvertently explained everything by trying to explain how I'm not sure if I should explain everything. How's that for complicated? But I will say, if you're here for the entertainment, I hope I'm delivering on some of that. And if you're here for the woodworking, hopefully I'm delivering on that as well. But if you're part of the group that's still wanting more of that in-depth woodworking stuff, go check out my Patreon page. I post a commentary video of every video I make for YouTube that's very much focused on the actual building process. And on top of that, I'm going to start a new series with some of my other maker friends where we sit down and just kind of chat about stuff. And I'm going to start releasing those pretty soon with these guys. So thank you for all the support. I couldn't do it without you. And hopefully you enjoy the extra content over there. Oh, and if you want a t-shirt, my Patreon page is the only place to get those. 
Thanks to the fine people at The Copper Tea, I have some of the nicest screen printed shirts out there. Go check them out if you want to put your name on a shirt. They're a small business run by great people, so you can't beat that. And helping each other out is what makes it all possible. So thank you. So we have two doors and one drawer front, all of which have handles cut, brass inlaid, finish applied in strategic areas, and everything laminated together thanks to the magic of air pressure. Up until this point, everything I was doing was tricky and confusing and required a lot of thought to make sure I was doing it right, but none of it was particularly stressful. Until now. This is technically the easiest part of making the doors and drawer, but definitely the most nerve-wracking. It was now time to cut everything to final size. Making these cuts are about as simple as it gets, but after the amount of work that has gone into each of these, the thought of cutting something too short or out of square was scary. It was, it was just scary. I used all the different combinations of saws to make these cuts, ripped some on the table saw, cross-cut some with a track saw, cross-cut some back on the table saw. Honestly, I just went with whatever I felt would give me the best result. And with the brass already inlaid, there was an extra layer to consider, especially when using a saw stop. But I managed to make all the cuts without completely screwing everything up, and I could then move on to installing the hinges. I almost always use this style of hinge as it's completely hidden when the door is closed and gives me the most amount of adjustability. On a big cabinet like this with inset doors and drawers, being able to adjust everything is super helpful and allows me to really dial in all of those gaps and get everything as even as possible. It's a good day when you make a cabinet and all you need is one drawer box. And it's an even better day when you use 3D modeling to make sure you're getting everything just right. Spoiler alert, I still managed to get it wrong. So I use Fusion 360 to model all of my designs before I actually build them. And I tend to fall into kind of a middle area where I model something to get an idea of things like size and shape and proportion, stuff like that. But I usually don't go as far as modeling intricate joinery or specific cabinet hardware and stuff like that. But as I use Fusion 360 to design more and more pieces of furniture, I find myself getting more and more detailed with my models, which has helped me become more and more efficient with my time and material. And with something specific like making a drawer box, sometimes the dimensions can be pretty precise, and by using computer design, I'm able to verify all of my dimensions before cutting into any material. So in the end, I now have a perfectly fitting drawer box ready to go into the cabinet. Ah. It doesn't fit perfectly. You know, sometimes you can be given all the tools and technology and if you can't follow the numbers, you're gonna have a bad time. And there's the face of somebody that's having a bad time. Now I'm no stranger to messing up a drawer box, but luckily this time I made the drawer box slightly too narrow. So I just had to add a small spacer between the cabinet side and the drawer slide to get things working properly. Given the situation, not too bad. And because I obviously hadn't attached my drawer front yet, there was really no issue there. I only attached it once I had the drawer box fitting properly. And once again, I used my favorite drawer box attaching method of using the screws slightly protruding through the box to mark their locations on the back side of the drawer front. It works like a charm and it's by far the easiest way I've found to do this. If I had my druthers, this is where I would stop a project. I built everything, it all fits together nicely and looks good, and all that's left to do is a million tiny little things. And all of them are annoying, especially with this piece. First, sand up all the brass and make it look nice. But of course, there are areas on this piece where the brass is inlaid into already finished plywood. So I have to tape it off so I don't mess up the finish. Makes the brass look great, but it's kind of annoying drill a bunch of shelf pin holes. This is completely utilitarian, just a place to add a few more shelves, and honestly, it doesn't even take that much time, but it takes some time, which is annoying. Cutting a back panel and the rabbit for said back panel. This one takes time and is messy. Using a router to cut a decent sized rabbit, especially in plywood with a partial MDF core, is gonna create a lot of dust, and dust is annoying. And of course, sanding and finishing. 
I feel like I'm getting a little complainy, so I'm not even going to go there. We'll just move on to the good stuff. So after all of that, do you trust me? There's exposed plywood all over this thing, but will you ever see it? No. Just don't start pulling off the doors or something. It's funny, even though I feel like I kind of cut corners on this piece, I'm also a little bit proud of how I was able to hide all of those things and how good it looks after it's all said and done. And by overcomplicating, I mean, by making things look interesting with some details like the brass and the door and drawer handles. For the most part, I don't think people will be looking for flaws when they see this piece. They'll just be looking at it and hopefully admiring it and imagining all the fancy clothes inside because they think it's an armoire. And while this cabinet could really be used to hold all sorts of things, whatever you want really, just don't call it an armoire. Because even though it might be full of fancy clothes, at the end of the day, it's really just a fancy pantry. Mm -hmm.